welcome to Good Libations, which is our show about mixology. And we're going to do something rather unique today in that we're going to muddle uh, both basil and mint to create a drink that is indeed unique and really, I think, quite clever. And I wish I could claim um, the originality of this drink, but I cannot. Actually, it came from a small boutique winery in Sonoma called the Medlock Ames Winery. And it's located in one of the most beautiful parts of Sonoma County. Um, it's located in the Bell Mountain Alexander Valley area. And the thing I like about this winery is that they don't just stick to producing wines, but they also have a restaurant where they have truly creative dishes that's actually down the road in Hellsburg in Sonoma County. And they also have a little speakeasy bar in the back of the restaurant where they create really unique cocktails, again, of their own making and own originality. And the cocktail that we're going to initially demonstrate is called the Verdant Virtue Vice. And again, it's a cocktail of their creation. But I want to read um, a little bit to you out of Wine and Food magazine about this cocktail and the originating of it. I thought this was quite interesting, in fact. It mentions here that this bar that they have in connection with um, this particular restaurant and winery, that it's a gold rush-inspired speakeasy with a photo booth and garden-to-bar cocktails, like the Verdant Virtue Vice made with fruits and herbs grown just outside. And it mentions that the garden beds planted with the help of kids from Sonoma County's school garden network are turned over when the seasons change. So in other words, you're getting things that are grown out of the garden and not only turned into food, but also turned into cocktails. And I think that is really fabulous. I mean, that is something that should be done everywhere. And they also have really interesting recipes um, at this particular winery. Um, some of them involve things like garlic herb encrusted lamb and also a pizza that they make with um, apparently cheeses that are sourced in Sonoma and Napa combined with like arugula and other ingredients and baked in a homemade you know, clay oven. But again, th this particular cocktail originated at that winery. And I think, again, that is something that is really unique and really interesting. And we're also going to talk about um, techniques that involve muddling and how we should properly muddle ingredients. Because sometimes people pulverize ingredients that are supposed to be muddled instead of muddle them. Because the whole idea is you want to extract um, the herbaceousness and you want to extract the oils from whatever you're muddling, which in this case is going to be basil and mint. But we don't want to overdo it because then what you're doing is you're over extracting and the flavors will overwhelm the base liquors. And this particular drink involves the use of chimney glasses, which is nice for eye appeal. It involves gin and it involves chartreuse green liqueur. And incidentally, this liqueur is not that easy to find because it's kind of fallen out of popularity. It used to be more popular in the 60s and 70s, and even probably the 50s. And it's made by um, Cathucian monks. And it's really interesting, on the back of the label, it mentions the fact that Cathucian monks from Grenoble, France, are the ones who originated and originally made this liqueur. And it's made with 187 different alpine herbs, if you can believe that. But what I've always noticed about it is the top note tends to be anisette. And the other ingredients, you can taste little nuances you know, of some of them. But of course, trying to accustom your palate to over 100 different herbaceous ingredients would be quite a task. And again, you, I usually don't tout using a particular liquor, but there is no substitute for using this in this particular cocktail. So again, chartreuse green liqueur from Cathucian monks from Grenoble, France. And in, incidentally, those of you who are cat aficionados probably know about the chartreuse cat. And actually, that cat was genetically created, you might say, from these also, these particular monks in Grenoble, France. 
So it's remarkable what they do. But anyway, we're going to get down to the actual demonstrating of this particular drink because, again, it is absolutely fabulous and absolutely unique. And there's a lot of people who are involved at the Medlock Ames Winery and also the restaurant and the little speakeasy bar. But interestingly enough, one of them is a Scotsman named Kenny Roqueford. Kind of a curious name because it obviously has um, a Norman French origin. But anyway, he's the one who pioneered the lamb recipe, the pizza recipe, and he also makes a hand-cut marmalade and homemade shortbread recipe that obviously was influenced from Scotland. But anyway, we're going to get down to the making of this unique cocktail. And what we first do is we take a chimney glass and we want to muddle again basil and mint. And it's good to use, I think, a little more mint than possibly the recipe called for. So I usually make sure that I've got several sprigs of mint in here. And also, I want to make sure that I have at least three bits of basil in here, but we don't want the basil to, um, you might say, eclipse or overwhelm the mint. So I put a bit more mint in there. And again, when we muddle this, what they do is they make a simple syrup on the premises. But I still prefer to use sugar when I muddle. And I also prefer to muddle it in the alcohol, which they don't do. They just muddle it in the simple syrup. But anyway, I add an adequate amount of sugar because, again, all of the sugar is not going to actually blend into the cocktail. It's more a medium for muddling. Plus, chartreuse green liqueur has a, has a hint of sweetness in of itself. Now, the chartreuse yellow, which is another liqueur made by Cathucian monks, is a tad sweeter and maybe a little more popular in the United States. But at any rate, I like to add a good amount of gin to do my muddling. And I'm going to do just such. And again, with regard to the muddling, this brings up another issue. On the previous program that we did that involved muddling, we used a proper muddler when we made mojitos. But what if you don't have one? Do you have to go out and buy one? Not necessarily. You could use a wooden spoon, or in this particular case, I'm using a kitchen wooden fork. And again, the idea is not to pulverize the mint in the basil but to muddle it, meaning that you bruise it a bit and you extract the goodness from the mint and from the basil so that it infuses into the base liquor and also the subtleties of the ingredients uh, uh, marry with one another and enhance one, one another and complement one another whether, rather than one overwhelming the other. And at this particular point, it's wise to put the ice in. And again, as I've um, endlessly mentioned before, it's good to keep the ice in something, even if it's just an ice bucket or some sort of a cooler that's going to keep the ice cold and keep it from melting and diluting. Because then again, that's going to detract from the cocktail if it becomes too dilute. And pardon the um, sloppiness here. But at any rate, then we're going to add the chartreux green liqueur, which makes this drink what it is. And what an intriguing name for it, too. Verdant Virtue Vice. Kind of cute, actually. And you add about half as much of the gin. And again, I tend to like to free pour. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. And at this particular point in time, the drink also requires the use of a full lime squeezed into it. And I already have a bit of a lime cut, so I'm going to use that and squeeze it in. And then I'm going to cut another lime and, you know, fill in the totality of the lime. So again, it's always better to hand squeeze because what you're doing is you're getting the oils out of the peel when you do that and it's better than using a juicer because with a juicer in fact you're not going to get the oils from the peel. So again hand squeezing is a proper technique and a valued technique when making certain types of cocktails. 
So again, I'm going to have to slice into another lime because I want to fill out this with the proper amount of the ingredients. And it's usually better and more user friendly if you're going to hand squeeze limes to quarter them or do something even smaller because it makes it easier to squeeze them. You're not struggling away trying to get the juice out and get the oils out. And as usual, I like to leave a spent shell in the drink, squeeze more lime in. And also, if you like, if you like a, a drink that's a bit sweeter, you can add Rose's lime juice. I'm a big fan of Rose's lime juice for many different reasons, but I like the dimension that it adds to drinks. And I'm going to stir this drink a bit. And then, as I do with the mojito, even though they don't do this at Medlock Ames um, restaurant and tasting room, I like to add a bit of sparkling water and unflavored sparkling water because I think that petalance adds a nice dimension to these type of drinks that are muddled. So at any rate, I'm going to stir it a bit more again to make sure that the mint, the basil <laughs> that just fell out, and the lime are nicely blended along with the sugar, the chartreuse, green liqueur, and the gin. And also, I do tend to uh, prefer to use gins, and they don't have to be costly, but gins that are made in the British Isles. Because, again, they tend to take, I think, a little more care in blending the juniper berries and all the other herbaceous ingredients that are used um, in making gin. And with this particular drink, I also like to add a slice of cucumber as a garnish, and also a wheel or a half wheel of lime as a garnish. And again, um, if you make this cocktail at home, you will be absolutely astonished at how unique it is because this is not something that you can just walk into your typical lounge or bar and get, even if it's an upscale restaurant. And the appearance is even attractive. Again, I tend to like to use a lot of the mint and the basil because I really want that flavor to be there because it complements, again, the chartreuse green liqueur and the gin. And again, this cocktail uniquely and interestingly is called the Verdant Virtue Vice. And there's nothing like it because apparently it was created at the Medlock Ames Winery. And I can only imagine how much it must complement um, the food there, you know, as a starter. And of course, the food is paired with their wonderful wines. And what a lovely area of Son Sonoma County as well. Now, I have actually created a cocktail, you might say, of my own doing. That's kind of a spin-off of this. And I've always liked Benedictine liqueur. And I especially like the combination of Benedictine and brandy. And incidentally, this is kind of neat, I think, but I have a bottle where you have Benedictine on one side and the B&B, &B, the Benedictine and brandy, on the other side. And I'm actually going to use the Benedictine and brandy in this particular cocktail. And I'm going to call this the B&B &B vice. And again, it's interesting, Benedictine liqueur is also made by an order of monks in Italy. And it's the Benedictine order, obviously. And it's in a place that's in central Italy that is called Monte Cassino or Cassino. So Benedictine is another herbaceous liqueur that in some ways is similar to the chartreuse green, but has its own nuances and its own complexity and I think interesting, unique ingredients as well. And it also pairs very well with gin. Now, a lot of people, getting back to the chartreuse green, like to drink it on the rocks with soda water or sometimes with tonic. And the same thing can be done with Benedictine or B&B, &B, plus both liqueurs can be drunk on the rocks as well as the chartreuse. But anyway, we're gonna do the same thing involving a chimney glass and we're going to muddle, again, basil and mint. And again, remember the technique is that we muddle the ingredients, not pulverize them, because then you're over-extracting. And you're left with a drink where you have fragments of mint and basil, but 
you can't really you know, see the actual leaves if you over extract and over muddle. And I tend to tear the leaves a little bit more for this drink also um, for the sake of, of extracting the oils from the leaves. And again, I add sugar to this drink, but you can make your own simple syrup. And you could either do it stovetop wise and just boil down the sugar, and it's a ratio of about one to one, a quarter cup of sugar to a quarter cup of water. Or you can even do it in the microwave. But, you know, just heat it until the sugar dissolves. But I personally like to use real sugar because the granulation and, you know, involves adding a different dimension to the drink. And again, this is a drink that is going to involve gin. So we're going to pour an adequate amount of gin in the drink. And we're going to muddle the ingredients, not just in the sugar or simple syrup, but within the gin itself. Again, with something that's not even a real muddler, but it works. And again, you can, you know, twist when you muddle, but don't overdo. Because the oils and the scent that I can detect already coming out of the mint and the basil is detectable when you do that muddling. And again, at this point, I'm going to add ice to the drink. And again, I'm going to add actually half lime and half lemon because I think Benedictine is best brought out in its flavor and complexity by a combination of both. Some people would say that just lemon is good enough, but I think if you add lemon and lime, you get a superior drink. And of course, lemons can be a challenge sometimes because the pits are in there, the seeds are in there, but you can simply remove them by hand and then squeeze in that lemon and leave a spent shell. Squeeze in the other half of the lemon. And then with the lime, again, you want to use a couple of quarters of the lime in the drink. And I think the lime is necessary because lemon alone is too subtle. The lime is necessary when using B&B. &B. So that's exactly what we're going to do. One more quarter, and then I'm going to actually add the Benedictine and brandy, the B&B, &B, and then the soda water, and perhaps a little bit more ice. And again, this is such an attractive bottle. The, the appearance of it is so attractive. And again, most of all, the, quanti the, qua the stuff that is in it is the thing that is the real issue. The B&B &B is just wonderful. And again, I like to add a splash of soda water to this particular drink and a cucumber slice. And also, some people might find it good if they muddle the cucumber when they do the mint and the basil. That's also an interesting possibility. And you can also cut the cucumber so that it's more cylindrically shaped. And you can also add larger slices of cucumber in this drink too, much as you would with a Pimm's cup, a gin sling, or some other cocktails where you add huge, you know, bits of cucumber cylindrically shaped. But in this particular case, I'm just going to fiddle with the cucumber a bit and put it right on top. But both of these cocktails are kind of spin-offs. This one is, is, you know, originated by Medlock Ames Winery. And this particular one is of my own creation, again. Um, and it involves similar ingredients, but not using chartreuse green, but using B&B. Using &B. But both of them are really refreshing. They're like mojitos in that they're a refreshing drink um, for hot weather, which we're still experiencing at this point in time. And they complement mojitos. If you're doing a party with mojitos, it might be good to try these drinks as well. Although, again, if you're going to serve <laughs> chartreuse liqueur, you better have deep pockets because it's quite expensive. Um, normally, this is a, 
I believe, a 325 milliliter bottle. It normally comes in 750 milliliter bottles, and usually it's over $60. But again, it's a wonderful um, ingredient for drinks, and it's been kind of left out of people's repertoire, you might say, of cocktails in a very, very long time, which is unfortunate because it is so very good. Again, Verdant Virtue Vice and the B&B &B Vice, that is from Medlock Ames Winery. This is from Ethel Andrews. And these are cocktails that you might want to try because they're more ambitious, they're unique, they're different. But again, it's something that's uh, going to make a statement at any party that you make that you're not a person who's just going to go along with specific trends, but you're going to put your own accents on things. And I meant to mention, too, when I made pomegranate martinis, that I actually like to add blood orange to them. Because if you squeeze in a bit of blood orange, or even if you get blood orange soda, it just changes the whole character of the pomegranate martini as being something more than what you would get at a typical establishment. So again, those little nuances mean a lot. They make something from ordinary to extraordinary and make them unique also. But again, we hope that you enjoy these cocktails. We hope you try them out. And we always want to emphasize on our show, Good Libations, that always be careful when you drink. Drink in moderation. Be responsible. We want to keep our community safe and well-spoken of. That is very, very important. And thank you again for tuning in to another episode of Good Libations. I'd like to let you know as well what I'm going to be talking about on future episodes of the program. There's many things that we're going to be broaching. Um, we're going to be doing other cocktails that are unique, some that are commonplace, but always using fresh ingredients and our own flourishes. And as well, we're going to talk about more muddling techniques, the reason why certain barware is used for certain drinks and why not. The reason, again, and we've talked about this before, but not to an adequate degree, but also the reason why certain garnishes are used. And I would actually like to demonstrate and show you proper ice storage and what we can use without elaborate means. We don't necessarily have to buy bar refrigerators or bar ice makers or whatever, but there are ways of ensuring that we can keep the ice really, really cold by, again, just using, you know, um, picnic coolers and things of that nature, even styrofoam ones. And also, we're going to talk about non-alcoholic drinks, because we know that many of you do not imbibe and do not partake of alcoholic beverages. But that does not mean that you have to settle for kitty drinks. Um, you can make more sophisticated beverages without using alcohol that an adult's palate would appreciate without feeling like you're having Shirley Temples and Roy Rogers or whatever. And that's important too because we can be creative and that's part of the responsibility that we always talk about when we drink. And again, these are future episodes. Some of these items are going to be talked about and broached. So it's something to look forward to. And again, we appreciate the fact, too, that our community is becoming more diverse and more sophisticated, both food-wise and beverage-wise, because that shows, again, that a different dimension is taking place here in Monrovia. And I think that's a lovely thing about our community as well. We have diversity ethnic-wise. We have diversity of palate, food preferences, and drink preferences. And really, the establishments that we've come to have here in Monrovia, I think, reflect the fact that this community has really grown and has expanded beyond boundaries. And also on future episodes, I'm going to have some friends of mine who are professional mixologists. In fact, one friend of mine who lives here in the community who has the name of Bob Barr um, is going to be on a program. and he in fact, is a mixologist at a high-level establishment in Orange County, a very high-level establishment, in fact. And him and I always talk shop when he comes to many of the um, venues where I do bartending at, and we always have wonderful conversations about what we do, and we compare techniques, and again, we kind of talk shop. And that's always fun to do, and hopefully, too, I'll have other guests 
mixologists on the show as time goes on, briefly demonstrating their techniques and what they can do. So we have a lot to look forward to. And again, I hope this program enhances appreciation for the chemistry behind mixology, as well as the fact that we can enjoy ourselves socially and relax and have a good time when we do things like this. And it's experimenting, it's being innovative, it's being creative, it's having fun. And all those things really matter as long as we keep it within the bounds of responsibility and sensibleness. And again, if we have a truly good palate and appreciate truly good things, we won't have a tendency to overdo. It's, as an example, if you made a gourmet dinner and the people who ate at your home just practically inhaled the food, that wouldn't really show appreciation for what you did for the creativity and for all the nuances in the food. But if they took their time to really taste everything and really enjoy it, that would be a compliment to you. And the same thing is true with cocktails. We want to make sure that when we make them and drink them, that they are enjoyed in moderation and sensibly for that very same reason that we enjoy food that way. And again, I'm Ethel Andrews. Thank you again for tuning into another episode of Good Libations. Thanks, and we will look forward to more.